Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for coming on Thrival Nutrition Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm awesome, Lahana. Thanks for having me on your show. I love your show, by the way. So I'm super excited to be here. Woohoo! That's awesome. Um, I am really excited to talk to you about this. Um, you know, I, I get questions. I never know how to respond. So I'm like, you know, let's just get an expert and let's just talk about it. So um, before we get started into the questions, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, who you are and what you do. Awesome. Thanks. Well, my name is Mike Marshall and um, I am uh, a native of South Chicago. So I grew up in the South side of Chicago, but I got to Texas as fast as I could. Um, I moved around a lot as a kid, uh, you know, four grammar schools, new middle school, three different high schools. So, you know, I'm a relationship guy because I had to be, I had to learn how to build relationships at a young age, which has really helped guide me in life. You know, um, very lucky to have met my wife of 22 years at a very early age. We have four amazing boys together. And, you know, uh, why we like your show is, you know, we've always been a very health and fitness minded family. Um, you know, all four of my boys, multiple sport athletes have had a lot of success at the collegiate level, both uh, in wrestling. Well, and we're hoping my younger guy's going to be a college <laughs> football player. But, uh, you know, proud dad moment there, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, but I'm also a career coach and mentor. You know, I've coached my boys and hundreds of other uh, athletes uh, coming up through the years. I've been a part of youth and high school athletics for 25 years. I'm still part of it today. I'm actually an official uh, for uh, wrestling and baseball. So, um, you know, really that, that, that part of it really just feeds one of my core values that I know you kind of align with also is that, you know, I love just helping others, you know, along this journey of my life, you know, um, and that really, that core value is really what aligned me perfectly with Mold Inspection Sciences Texas, uh, which I am the chief operating officer. And then also with Texas Mold Assessors and Remediators Association, which is a nonprofit we created in July of this year. Um, and we're all in this industry for a reason, and that's really to help people in their time of need, uh, which I know really aligns with you too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. And honestly, I feel like to you, I mean, nutrition, I'm just like, this is my jam. But like when it comes to like, we cover, you know, when I'm working with clients, we cover like new environment. And so always like being aware. And one of our questions on our questionnaire is, have you ever been like exposed to mold? Um, or have you been in a house, you know, that has mold? And I mean, outside of that, I think it's a really fascinating because I feel like lately I've either been hearing a lot about it or people have I mean, I don't know. I don't know why or where, which is why you're here, um, of why even it comes to happen. But um, I think that like, it's super interesting when I hear stories of like, I all of a sudden like just started not feeling well, like everything came out fine. And we like, okay, decided to test our house for mold. And all of a sudden we find out like, it's just, there's so much mold. And there's mm -hmm. so much like exposure and like people start having like hormonal issues. And I just think it's crazy fascinating um, because it's not something right? And I know you'll probably cover this. It's not something like you can always see. So that makes me paranoid. So I don't know. No, like, you're exactly, I go. you're exactly right. Yeah. You can't always see it. Um, which is why we test, right? Yeah. Um, so I would love to just start off with the basics of like, what are the molds and like, why do they grow in our houses? Sure. Sure. So, um, yeah, thanks for asking me. Uh, molds are microscopic fungi, fungi, however you want to pronounce it, live on plant and animal matter, right? Um, they're a part of the environment. They can be found indoors, outdoors, we eat them, we breathe them. Uh, they're in the air, they exist, you know, and they play a very important role in nature uh, because they break down and digest organic material. That was their intent by nature. Uh, nature didn't know we were going to build structures that were going to be full of their food. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the reasons why they grow uh, indoors. <clears throat> you know, the real reason it grows indoors, though, is, you know, again, we've created the perfect atmosphere indoors for it to grow. We take in organic materials like drywall, carpet, leather, clothing, foods. We put it all together in a nice warm place for it. And then every now and then we introduce some water, either intentionally or unintentionally. And those are the three things that needs to grow uh, indoors is a food source, some actual mold spores, and then the introduction of moisture or water. And uh, you have the perfect environment for it to grow indoors. 
Awesome. And so kind of going back to that question is like, sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. So like, do, does, can mold just grow in between? And like, so that is a thing. That's not just sure. So anywhere there's an organic type material. So in the insulation inside your walls, the insulation in your attic, um, it can grow anywhere. So if it has a little bit of moisture and organic material, something to eat, um, it can grow on any of those things. So we are the ones who actually make the decision, maybe inadvertently, to hide where it can grow, you know, behind drywall, behind, you know, paneling, behind wallpaper, underneath carpet, you know, we make those decisions to put those things there because it makes us live more comfortably. Uh, it looks nicer, it feels better, it insulates us in our homes, right? So mold was meant to grow outdoors and be spread outdoors by the air, you know, they're they're microscopic particles and fragments that get carried by even the slightest breeze. So yeah, it was meant to be outdoors. And then we kind of created this situation ourselves by building, um, you know, with building materials and things that it can eat. And then again, the moisture is what really, uh, you know, triggers that growth. Awesome. And so, you know, I, I'm sure that there's a lot of different kinds, but so I know black mold people, like that's what you hear black mold, you, you get scared. So is that the most common one is like, or is there one major type? So, so the black mold is like one of those fear mongering terms, right? Yeah. Um, it's like the dark web, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, it exists and it's there, but you know, people will say black mold. Well, you know, molds come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and, um, you know, black is one of the colors, but multiple types of molds that are black um, are not the ones that they necessarily refer to as the black mold. You know, stachybotrys oh. is kind of like that scary one. Uh, toxigenic molds, those types, marker spores, uh, penicillium, aspergillus, uh, you know, catomium, those are the more toxigenic types of molds. But, you know, the black mold term is, you know, yeah, they all come in different shapes and sizes and colors. Just because it's black doesn't mean it's harmful. Just because it's not black doesn't mean it isn't harmful. So yeah, so every like, if you do have mold in your home, it's not, al it's not always technically black mold, right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. I mean, and outside of like, you know, having a professional like you guys come in, is there any way you could tell the difference? Like just from someone that has no idea, any education on mold, but they might see it. Is there any difference visually? So technically by just by looking at it, you can't tell, you know, okay. um, taking a sample of it and sending it into a lab and having them actually look at it under the microscope is, you know, really the only true way to tell uh, if it's mold or not. We've seen it a lot of times, you know, hundreds of times where we're on site, we have looked at something and we're, we're pretty certain that it's mold. And we take a sample of it and send it into the lab, comes back, it's not mold. I mean, it's happened a lot. And then on the other side of that, we've seen some things where we're kind of like, well, that doesn't, it, it doesn't look like mold. And then we test it. And sure enough, it comes back and it's mold. So wow. it could go either way. And those, you know, those data, the data we get from the lab results is, you know, very important. Yeah. So, and I know the obvious signs of potential mold is like seeing the moisture, like in the window seals or just some type of like wet roof. I mean, you name it. Is there any other like things that we would see that could potentially, you know, be a risk, a higher risk factor for mold? So, you know, preventing moisture intrusion and high humidity in the homes is definitely, you know, the key to preventing mold growth. So preventing those types of situations uh, is, is the best way to prevent the mold growth in the homes. If you're, if you're seeing something that looks like mold, you know, you should definitely yeah. have an assessment, you know, have somebody come out and take a look at that for sure. Um, but there's not like a short tell sign of, Yes, this is what something I should get looked at. This is something I shouldn't get looked at. You know, we get calls, you know, the three, the three major calls we get are, you know, something looks funny in my house, something smells funny in my house, or somebody's having an, a reaction, you know, in a room or a specific area of the home, they have an allergic type reaction, right? So, you know, the latter two, um, something smells funny, 
or something, I'm sorry, something looks funny and somebody's getting sick, um, you know, those are the ones that we really want to get tested. Gotcha. Know. Gotcha. Um, and then, you know, how long does it take to grow? So in the right conditions, uh, you know, generally speaking, 70 degrees for most molds, you know, um, and humidity levels above 55, mold can begin to germinate and grow 24 to 48 hours. Wow. Um, typically spores begin to colonize, you know, three to 12 days, and then, you know, become visibly visible, you know, shortly thereafter. So, you know, like during storms, like, you know, the most recent one we had here in, in Texas with uh, tropical storm Imelda, you know, we're right about that three week mark where we're going to start getting some calls where people, you know, the water receded and now they're, you know, starting to smell something funny or starting to see something funny. We should be starting to get some of those calls right about now. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, I was just going to ask you, like, are there more places that are prone to get mold ge geography wise, you know, whether like living on the beach, you're more likely to get mold or does, does that matter? I mean, I know it's everywhere, but do you, is, I don't know, is there more cases like in Florida and like South Texas? Cause we're like along the coast or anything like that. Yeah. It has a lot to do with the water table, you know, um, the, and the more rain we get, uh, the more, uh, water, the, the higher the water table is, um, you know, things, due to the stack effect and you know, we have some homes with crawl spaces and things of that nature underneath us, you know, moisture and heat rise, you know, as it evaporates. So it can be oh, coming up actually through, you know, through the floorboards, through uh, the, uh, out of the uh, crawl spaces. And uh, so, yeah, there are definitely areas that are more susceptible to mold due to, you know, weather patterns. And again, you know, higher water tables. Wow. That's really interesting. I didn't even think about like, crawl spaces and like basements and things like that. I yeah. didn't even come across. I'm from Florida, so I don't think about that stuff because I've mm -hmm. never had like a basement before. Um, I would love for you to dive a little bit deeper into what you were mentioning about preventing the mold growth, things that we can do, things that we can have um, to prevent that. Sure. Um, so, you know, again, it's removing that moisture that's in the home you know, ex excess moisture. You know, some of the more damp rooms in the homes are where we're more susceptible to see that growth. You know, places like laundry rooms or uh, bathrooms. Um, you know, we can all take a little bit of advice here on a small item that does a lot of good in removing some of that excess humidity and moisture in the bathroom, and that's turning on the bathroom fan. You know, and, and I know it sounds so simple and people, people are like, oh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it does a great job also of removing uh, odor when we're uh, catching up on some reading, but it also does an even better job of removing some humidity or a lot of humidity in those rooms where, you know, you, if you're taking a shower or, you know, running the hot water for a longer period of time, you leave that bathroom fan running for five to 10 minutes uh, after you uh, get done running the water, um, you can really do a lot to remove that moisture and excess humidity in there. Um, <clears throat> another thing I know, I might catch some slack for this one, but that retro 1970 bathroom wallpaper that everybody loved, you know, uh, uh, black no and white No slack stripe. for that. Yeah. Uh, it's got to go. No, I mean, it doesn't have to go, but it does, it, it, again, it does another, it, it traps that moisture inside. Uh, a lot of times it's where we end up seeing a lot of growth is inside of that wallpaper. And then uh, another one of my all times favorite is uh, uh, bathroom carpet. Like who thought that was a good idea? Um, that is the worst idea. I've only seen that a couple of times. And every time I see that, I'm like, why would you do this? Sorry yeah. if anyone's listening. To that. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry too. But, <laughs> but I mean, what we do there as, as humans, because maybe it's a little more comfortable, maybe it looks a little bit nicer, but again, we create the perfect environment for potential microbial growth when we do, when put those things in. And that's, we really are, you know, the creators of, uh, of this situation in our homes because we put the things in there that it wants to eat. Uh, we keep it at a, an ideal temperature for it. And then we introduce moisture. So it doesn't know any better than to just hang out and grow. Yeah. Do you find any benefit in like having a really good air purifier? Um, I mean, I know that doesn't really affect the source of the issue, but um, what are your thoughts on that? Because I know a lot of air purifiers, you know, claim like 
they filter out like a lot of the molds, of course, other allergens, but. Yeah, I would say definitely check the, uh, the rating of the filter. Um, you know, some mold fragments can get down to below three microns, which most, you know, most only, um, filter out up, you know, down to three, even the, you know, some of the best ones. So I guess it would just depend on the actual filter. So I can't, I'm not going to say it doesn't do good. They do, um, do good. Um, but, uh, you know, just checking on that, on those filters, it's not going to pull out everything, uh, you know, mold fragments, um, and also releases, uh, you know, mycotoxins in the air, which can get down to, you know, uh, as little as uh, one micron, even smaller. So, um, I'm not going to say that they're bad, but uh, they're not the yeah. be-all, end-all. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I know we're going to get talk more into like testing and treating. So before we get into, you know, the pro, like, I, I guess, okay, I guess the word I'm looking for is proper way to test, but uh, those Amazon kits or any type of kit that can people can buy online, you know, whether they're trying to take the cheap way before they invest, or maybe they're just curious. What are your thoughts on, on those tests that people can purchase? So- the biggest drawback, I think, to those types of tests is the inconsistency in testing method, uh, just because most people don't necessarily know exactly how to test. Uh, there's no real chain of custody, so you don't really know the environment it's been in before it got to you. You don't really know the environment it's been in once it leaves you. So does it really give you the answer of what's going on in that room? If you get a negative test, does it really mean there's nothing going on in there? Well, depends on where you tested, what you tested, um, was it happening specifically right in that area? You know, normally those tests, um, you know, are, are we talking about the, the, the Petri dish type tests or that smaller, you know, uh, the actual um, vacuum type tests that you can get. And then it's how much air are those actually bringing in? Um, you know, there's a lot of gray area in, in that, on that subject. So we're not a fan. Uh, obviously, we, uh, we believe in getting a licensed professional out there. We do go through uh, a lot of training in how to properly test these areas. And, um, you know, we feel that's the, the best and most professional way to test. Definitely. And even from my standpoint, I agree. Um, you know, people get like food sensitivity tests all the time, just online or wherever. And um, when you actually work with a professional and they get like the good test. Yes, it's more money, but you're actually getting accurate results and you're not wondering like, okay, well this says like I'm not allergic or or I mean sensitive or I don't have mold in my home. But I feel like in the back of your head, I would be like, but do I do do I have mold in my home? Do I right. actually have a sensitivity? So I think yeah. the money is so worth it just to have like a peace of mind if by chance someone does think that they have mold in their house. Um so I just want you to kind of go in of like how, like what people should do if they think they have a mold problem, like the process of, of it. Sure. Um, you know, again, we get, we usually get one of those three calls, you know, something's either looking funny, smelling funny, or somebody's getting sick. So, you know, we believe that it's the best to get an assessment company out uh, to take a look at what's going on in tests. Cause it's not necessarily always the mold that you see um, that's causing the problem. It's the mold that you can't see. Um, that is why we run the air tests we do. And we do, you know, when we come out, when an assessment company comes out, a licensed mold assessment company comes out, you know, they're going to do normally a full inspection of the home, which is going to include that moisture intrusion inspection. Uh, we're going to look for all the areas where you could have had a past water leak. You could have current, a current water leak, you know, we at mold inspection scientists come in, we do a thorough exam with a thermal, thermal camera. Uh, we take a look at all the drywall, uh, the outside of the house. We're looking for any penetrations into the home that might be allowing a moisture intrusion. And you're really going to get a much better peace of mind than just buying an Amazon test kit and running a small air sample in one area. We're going to give you a full picture of exactly what's going on. And then once we do find that out, we're going to give you the exact remedy to take care of it. And it's going to give you the peace of mind that it was done right. It was done right the first time. And you're going to be able to get that home back to being as healthy as possible uh, a lot faster than if you decided to uh, do it yourself. Yeah, I know. I've, I've, um, 
when I was looking into this before, I've noticed that like every company is kind of different on like what they test for. So I noticed that some like there was air samples, some was like the ther- the thermal um, on the outside and inside. Are there other, other places that you guys test for um, that are like probably known? Well, if you were to have mold, it'd probably be something there like the bathrooms and stuff like wall samples. Like what are some other samples that you guys do? So yeah, so we can do a wall cavity sample. It's, uh, you know, it'd be at the client's request. If they had an area where they, you know, thought they had an issue, we could do a wall cavity sample. Uh, we normally um, don't recommend intrusive investigation unless we see something um, specific to that. Um, it's not part of our normal process. We do do uh, we do recommend air samples in areas where there's been a past water intrusion issue reported, or we find some wet materials, you know, like drywall um, in that specific area. Um, if we see something, uh, you know, a, um, a mold-like sub- substance, we do recommend a surface sample so we can figure out exactly what type of mold uh, that is, and then also a, an air sample in that area to see if that particular mold is actually affecting the air quality in the same area. Very cool. Um, and I know you kind of mentioned, like, after testing, you kind of tell them, like, the if you do have mold, you know, the way to fix that. What does that look like? Sure. So the, um, the state of Texas is actually a regulated state of the mold industry. The regulations are set up so that a mold remediation company uh, or a contractor, you know, an individual contractor doesn't just come in and, you know, say, oh yeah, that looks like mold to me. Uh, I think we're going to have to come in and gut this whole room for you. Um, so, you know, the, the regulations are set <clears throat> to prevent the conflict of interest you know, uh, that could occur with, you know, some uh, unethical contractors or, or individuals to come in and, and, pre- and uh, present a situation like that. So the assessment company comes out, uh, re- assesses the situation. Now, we don't get paid any more or any less if we find mold or if we don't find mold. Um, but we, what we will do is we'll create what's called a mold remediation protocol. And that's really to minimize the removal of material. It's going to um, what, what's going to be needed to remedy the situation in the most least invasive way possible. Um, you know, I guess the most invasive way to get rid of mold is just, just gut the whole house. Right. I mean, that you could always just do that. Right. But that's not cost down. prohibitive. <laughs> yeah. That's not cost prohibitive to everybody. And it's, it's not smart. Right. So you, the assessment company comes out and will give you that limited scope of work and tell you exactly what needs to be done we give that to the, or you give that to the mold remediation contractor, and then they follow that to a T. And then we'll come back out and we, we perform what's called a post-assessment clearance test to make sure that they came out, they followed the protocol, everything that we told them to do, they did. And then we'll test again to make sure it was all removed and then give you that certificate of mold damage re- remediation, also referred to as the CMDR in Texas, which is basically saying, you know, to quote the old movie, this house is clear. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm glad you brought that up because I have heard that. So like you guys aren't a company that also provides those remediation services. You are just the inspection. And I've heard that just kind of helps with reducing the, I guess, bad integrity or not having integrity. Yeah, Yeah, correct. You know, that conflict of interest is why the regs are there. So you can, you, let me just be clear. You can, be a mold assessment company and a licensed mold assessment company and also a licensed mold remediation contractor. Your company can have both of those license. You're just not allowed to work on the same project that you did an assessment on. So if you do the assessment on a project, you can't be the remediation contractor on that same project. I, I appreciate that. Like a ton that definitely, I think will ease minds. Cause I know like some people, of course, they're like, you know, oh, they found, they found something. And then I don't know, tons of things that could happen, but that's not like that with every state, right? I know you're just mentioning that Texas has those policies in place. That is correct. And, you know, mold inspection science as Texas is one entity of our company. We do have a sister company. Uh, the name of that company is mold inspection sciences. And we're in 13 other markets. And, you know, we do run into that quite a bit in other markets where, you know, the mold remediation company is coming out and offering that free mold test. 
And then of course, not of course, but a lot of times, yeah. <laughs> lo and behold, we found mold and we have to remove all this material. And then, you know, and it's, it's, you know, we talk about getting a, getting a true assessment company to come out that doesn't have any conflicts of interest that don't, doesn't perform mold remediation to come out and give you that true assessment. We're the, we're the unbiased third party here. You know, we want to make sure we help you and we want to make sure that they're not taking advantage of you. I love that. Um, I think one last question I have is, how do you feel about people like trying to DIY, like they're like taking out mold? I don't know. To me, I just want to know it's done right and taken out, but people like tend to like just DIY it. Do you find that, do you feel like that's effective or do you still feel like some people like they end up just doing it, but not working? No, really like, thanks for asking me that question because we see it so often where, you know, you try and remedy the situation yourself and what ends up happening a lot of times or sometimes is that the problem gets worse because you cross contaminate, right? Mold spores are microscopic. You may think that you're just doing a little bit of work here and you're just, you're being very careful, but you're really actually disturbing the mold and it's spreading and the air in your home is turbulent, right? So it's moving and you may end up with a bigger problem than what you had, what you had to start with. So the you know couple hundred dollars that you think you're saving yourself on the front end ends up turning into thousands and thousands of dollars because now not only do you have a problem in one room now you got a problem in four you know all the adjacent rooms are now affected so um we frown upon do-it-yourself remediation uh Bye. you know li hiring a licensed mold assessor and a licensed mold remediator um, to come in and give you that exact scope of work. They're going to set up proper containments. They're going to ensure no cross-contamination is taking place. And we can actually limit the scope of work to just that area. Uh, but we come in behind it hundreds of times where we've ran into a DIY project or somebody brought in, you know, a guy who thought they knew what they were doing and, uh, you know, they actually made the problem even worse. So Wow. So, like, not just simply, like, spraying something on it, removing the material, spraying something doing a fan that's not gonna that's not gonna cut it you know i don't say in all cases i can't you know speak to all cases yeah it's yeah a smaller problem but a lot of times we come in behind these jobs mm -hmm. where that that exact thing happened they thought it was just going to be this small thing they cut out some material and that's really where it's at you start removing material start taking some stuff out and next thing you know you have a bigger problem so yeah um yeah. yeah. I mean, I see it a lot too with diet. Everyone just trying, trying to DIY and then they come to me and they're like, I just feel like I make things worse. I'm not feeling better. I'm like, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I feel like that's very similar in, in, in my case as well. Yeah. Um, so where can people find, find you guys? Sure. Our, uh, our, well, here in Texas, our, our website address is moldinspectiontexas.com. And uh, you can also find um, us at uh, the Texas Mold Assessors and Remediators Association at www.tmara.org. And that kind of goes more through the uh, legislative process and the laws. Um, and then you can also reach us by phone at 888-335-6653 or 888-335-MOLD. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun.